Last night, as our programme faded into the dusk, and all the creatures at Wild Ken Hill settled down to soak up the serenity of the stormy sunset, peace and tranquility were the mood of the moment. But under the cover of darkness, danger was stirring. Brace yourselves for Spring Watch. And welcome to Spring Watch on a sunny <laughs> evening. Yes, no rain and stormy clouds. We've actually got the last rays of sunset going down here live at Wild Ken Hill on the northwest coast of Norfolk. And we've got a cracking show coming up tonight. We've started strong, haven't we? We've had some great science already. Last night, the thermal flowers, mm. Osmia, the little bee laying its eggs inside that shell. Plenty more to come. Every week for three weeks, 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, BBC Two, Monday to Thursday. And tonight we've got some interesting behaviour too. We've got a rather gruesome meal deal coming up for you a bit <laughs> later on. It may put you off your own supper, you're eating it. Uh, the emphasis is on ma'il, ma'il. <laughs> But that's an absolute cracker. And I've also got to say, we've got probably the biggest news in the British bird world for some time coming up later on the programme. As usual, we've got our cameras on lots of nests scattered across this area. And we've been watching them for the last three days and things have been going... Well, they've been going OK. I mean, the weather's not been great for a lot of our birds, but they've been doing pretty well until last night when it all kicked off. And we saw something that we've never seen before on Spring Watch. In fact, we've never expected to see. And at 11.23, when all our phones started pinging with the news, well, the whole team was pretty shocked. And it's to do with our skylark nest. This is how we left it last night. This is the nest with the adult coming in, feeding the three chicks. We noticed two of the chicks doing very well, one of them not developing so well. That was the little runt. But generally, things are going OK for that nest. Well, as I say, they were going OK, but if we take a look at that nest now, we can see that it's empty. You know, we were worried about the runt, we were worried about the rain, we were worried about predators. I mean, we saw our kestrel feed a skylark to its chicks. It wasn't our skylark, but obviously there were so many things that could have happened to that nest. But we certainly weren't expecting the scenario that played out last night. Now, just a warning before I show you, you know, it's not an easy watch if you're a sensitive person, but this is what happened. So this is the nest, and there's the adult sitting with the chicks, all is calm. And then our nest watchers noticed a bit of snuffling and a bit of shuffling in the grass. Now you can see the adult is alerted. It comes closer and the adult spooked off. The shuffling and snuffling continues. What on earth is it? We could just about look through the grass, you can see some spines. And then our nest watchers noticed some ears and then the nose of a hedgehog. No one was particularly concerned. It's just a hedgehog. It's not going to do any harm. Or is it? So the hedgehog gets into that nest. You saw one of the chicks escape. And then it starts to predate the other two chicks. One of the chicks, we think it was the runt, and she does a, a very good effort at trying to escape. But unfortunately, they both end up in the jaws of the hedgehog. It's the sound that is pretty terrifying. Just listen. You can hear the chick squealing and you can hear the hedgehog munching. And you can see the unfortunate leg of one of those chicks. And the hedgehog makes a right meal of our two little chicks there. 
and then shuffles off into the night, unaware that it's been caught on camera. Who would have thought it? The hedgehog has predated the Skylarks. <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> I know, even had the temerity to lick its lips right in front of the camera. We tend to think of hedgehogs as invertivores, opportunistic invertivores, normally feeding on beetles, caterpillars and earthworms. They'll also add earwigs, millipedes, centipedes, spiders, slugs and snails to their diet. But they have to eat between 60 and 80 grams wet weight of food a night, and if they get the opportunity, they'll take ground nesting birds or their eggs. And of course, that was a basket of meat for that mm -hmm. hedgehog and it took advantage of that. And we've seen them doing this, unfortunately, on the Western Isles of Scotland, on South Uis, where they were uh, introduced. And now there's a programme to remove the hedgehogs from there. And in one study, they were leading to the losses of between 36 and 64% of lapwing, snipe and red shank nest, all ground nesting waders. So in certain places, they can be significant predators of ground nesting birds. And in another study, 10% of one group of ground nesting birds were again failing due to hedgehog predation. So, pretty serious stuff. But do remember, at the same time, that our hedgehogs, one of the nation's favourite mammals, has been in precipitous, calamitous decline. A study published earlier this year showed that in rural areas, and especially here in the east of England, that decline was up to 75%. So that hedgehog that snuffled out of the hedge last night and found that basket of skylarks got a decent meal and it aided its own survival chances. And that's the way the world goes round. Yeah, but it's not all bad news, is it? It's not all bad news, because if we go back to that nest now, we will see that the adults have been coming in throughout the course of the day. We typically see this when nests have been predated. The adults do, through habit, keep coming back with food. Little contact call there, the plaintive contact call of the skylark, looking for its youngsters. It will, of course, eat that food itself when it realises they're not there. But from the skylark's point of view, yeah, a, a temporary disaster. But these birds can sometimes triple brood, so they can have three clutches a year. And there's every likelihood, I think, that at this time of year, this pair will get back together, make another nest, have another clutch of eggs, and there's still a chance that they'll get some, you know, chicks out into the wider world a bit later in the season. You can't help but feel sorry for those parents, though. I mean, desperately coming back, looking for those chicks. And although I say it every year, although we empathise with the prey, you can't demonise the predator. So we still love Mrs Tiggy Winkle, don't we? We certainly do. <laughs> certainly do. Let's cheer ourselves up a bit by looking at some other nests. We've got a new nest to show you, in fact. It's another ground nester. It's a lapwing. Let's have a look at it live. Here it is. Oh, it's looking glorious, isn't it? In that gorgeous sun that we've got. But as we pull out, you can see, I say, it's ground nesting. And it's right out there in the open. It's sitting on four eggs. I've got to say, it's making me feel a bit nervous now. Now we've seen that hedgehog going around. I mean, goodness knows what's going to happen to those eggs. But very close to our lapwing, we've got another ground nester. And that's the oyster catcher. Oh, look at that glorious shot of its head. Love the red beak of an oyster catcher sitting on two eggs. So as I say, they're both vulnerable nests, but I'm really keeping my fingers crossed that it's a bit of a happier ending than our skylark. And those even two. if the hedgehog does go to those nests, they're much larger birds. You might have noticed the adult skylarks diving in, in the pitch black, trying to get that hedgehog away from the nest. Well, the oyster catcher there, equipped with that stout, robust bill, would yeah. probably do a better job of trying to drive the hedgehog away. You know what has been seen there, though? Hares, apparently. And so, obviously, a hare wouldn't go for the egg, but no. it's a big, a big mammal. <laughs> you know, relatively big, um, could trample the eggs, couldn't it? Trampling is a problem with See, cattle. My nerves are all there now. <laughs> sheep in some areas, and sheep have been seen recently, Goodness. a little study that's just been published, sheep eating lots of ground nesting birds' eggs. Anyway, let's move on from that. Up exterior here, relatively calm, yep. sort of level-headed, pretty well, normal. <laughs> Underneath, I'm boiling with excitement. I was nearly in tears last night when I got some news, news which I consider to celebrate one of the most 
important and greatest UK conservation successes in recent times. So and we're going to announce it tonight. Megan has got the privilege of doing that. But I know there's one man who's going to share my sense of overwhelming excitement, <laughs> and that is the one and only Yolo Williams. Yes, indeed, very much so, Chris, and I can't wait to hear the full story from Megan later on. Now, tonight, I want to introduce you to a very smart-looking and a very interesting bird, but I'm not going to give you the bird's name. Oh, no, a little quiz here. I'm going to give you a big clue. You ready? Here we go. Ooh! 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 Yes, I can hear you all at home shouting at the TV screen, Ida Ducks! And you're right, of course, I want to talk to you about the beautiful, the striking Ida Duck. They are truly impressive birds, a chunky duck as well. They can weigh up to 2.8 kilograms, and in level flight, they can reach speeds of 76 kilometers. That is 47 miles an hour. Amazing, amazing birds. And their distribution here in the UK was well, very much a northern one. They found around uh, Northern Ireland, all around the coast of Scotland, the north of England, and as far south as Anglesey. And a real stronghold for them is Shetland. So much so that up there, they've even got their own name. They call them Dunters. And this flock here up in Shetland, well, they found some fresh water on a rocky shore. And I'm going to keep quiet so that you can listen to them for a moment. Isn't that lovely? It's, it's a little bit like a kind of a mindful moment from Shetland. They've got to be my favourite duck. And here on Mull, well, they're fairly widespread around the coast, so we sent out our long-lens cameraman in search of them. Now's a good time to film them because they're on the sea with their ducklings. Now, when these ducklings hatch within hours, they leave the nest, they follow the mother all the way down to the sea and they stick close to her. Fair play, the males play their part as well. They'll stay nearby and keep an eye open. And often you'll find them forming large creches. I've seen a creche of 36 chicks with eight adults keeping an eye on them. And here in Mull, they tend to keep to the most sheltered locations. Sheltered bays, quiet lochs where they're out of the storms. And, of course, the adults need to keep an eye open for things like otters and white-tailed eagles as well. So where do they nest? Well, they'll nest on some of the small offshore islands or on rocky coasts like this as well. Male takes no part in incubating because he's too colourful, too obvious, but her camouflage is absolutely perfect. Now, she'll incubate those eggs for 25 days, 25 days, and in that time she can lose up to 40% of her weight. She's an exceptional mother, and she plucks feathers out of her breast to make that nest. And, of course, Ida feathers are famous for being warm, and very, very comfortable. Why is that? Well, let me reach this. It's all going to do with the structure. Let me show you here. Here we go. Let's have a look at the primary feather first of all, and you'll see here that the barbules have lots of hooks on them, and those hooks are adapted to latch on to other barbules. So that gives it a very flat 2D appearance. Then the down feathers, well look at the down feathers, the barbs here fire off in all directions and the barbules, the little teeth, they're well spaced and they're adapted to hook on to other down feathers. So that gives it a real 3D appearance and what that means is that they trap a lot of warm air in amongst those down feathers and that is why Ida down is so valued. It's malleable, it's soft, and it's very, very warm too. And Meg's down there in Kielder Forest. You must be watching this thinking, what on earth is an Ida down? You're far too young to remember, Meg's. Yeah, I can't admit I can remember any of that. I mean, I personally have recycled water, uh, recycled water bottles as my bedding. I don't know if that kind of relates or not, but there we go. Um, now, Chris earlier on mentioned that we have a very, very special announcement to make, and I am honoured that I get to be able to tell it to you today. 
So ospreys, unfortunately due to persecution, were extinct as a breeding bird in the UK in 1847. But 100 years later, they started to naturally recolonize and we hoped that that would spread rather quickly. However, they are rather sedentary. They always go back to the same place that they were originally bred from. And it did happen over the course in some areas. They went down into parts of Scotland and into Wales, but sometimes they needed a helping hand. So translocation projects became really important and are very successful. Birds of Paul Harbour and the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation got together because there haven't been breeding ospreys in the south of England for over 200 years. And for the first time, we've got some really exciting news for you. There's a bird that we all fell in love with called CJ7. And in the lockdown of 2020, she grabbed our hearts to the South Isolating Bird Club. But let's take a look at her story. So she was attracted to Paul Harbour because of the translocated birds. She actually was reared in Rutland. And here she is, she arrives in 2020, and this is when the nation began to fall in love with her. She started displaying breeding behavior, a really exciting sign that her instinct was strong. And here, actually, she is laying an egg. But unfortunately, there was no male around, so that egg was infertile. She actually uh, laid three of them, but sadly, no male showed up, so there were no chicks that year. And we thought, that's a huge success. Maybe in 2021, it'll happen. Well, let's have a look. Did a male come? So CJ7 arrived just like clockwork, as she does brilliantly. You can see her feeding here. And look there, a male. 022 comes in and immediately they get down to business. We see them mating and they form this pair bond really, really quickly. And it's really important because they are a largely monogamous species. So they have to have a really strong pair bond going forward for years to come. He starts bringing in fish. A behaviour that you see would happen because he'd be supplementing her and chicks if they were there. But unfortunately, 2021 wasn't the year because he arrived too late in the season and she again laid unfertilised eggs. But 2021 wasn't the year. It had to be 2022, didn't it? And last night, I got some fantastic news. Let's take a look at their journey through 2021. So what we saw, 2022, sorry, 2022, we have both individuals back. They both arrived on time and they both started mating very, very quickly. And I can't tell you how excited we were to see this. Look at that, mating against the setting sun. It was really rather remarkable. And here you can see, this is CJ7 laying an egg. Her first fertilized egg and what an amazing achievement that was. And they're nest building, he's supplementing with food. It's all going along in the right track. And at 9.45 last night, I got the text message that their behavior suddenly changed. But we had to wait until this morning to confirm. And we were umming and ahhing, has it happened? Has that egg hatched? Well, look at this. CJ7 and 022 looking down very tentatively. And this is a behavior that you see more so once those eggs have hatched. But look really carefully what's in the bill because it is the most rem remarkable moment it's an eggshell so we have an egg that has hatched we have breeding ospreys in the south of england for the first time in nearly 200 years amazing amazing work i've got a personal connection to cj7 so i've been rooting for her all the way but i have to congratulate of course paul morton birds of paul harbour tim mackerel roy dennis wildlife foundation and all the volunteers that had a hand in this because this is a huge success in raptor conservation so i take my hat off to you congratulations and who knows in 14 years time perhaps the picture in, in paul harbour is going to look like the one here in kilda we know that our kilda ospreys do remarkably well 93 uh, 92 fledges so far and maybe in 14 years time we will have multiple nests by multiple pairs what an incredible thing that is so from a species which needed a bit of a helping hand to recolonize to one that doesn't need so much help i think i need a moment after that how great was that <laughs> rabbits. This is the story of how they shape their landscape and the lives of those who live here by tooth and paw. It all begins with a bite to eat. With every mouthful of grass munched, 
Rabbits encourage a special community of plants to flourish and prevent the grassland from becoming overgrown. Which is very much appreciated by their neighbours. The sharp yellow sights of stone curlew are set on hunting worms, beetles and woodlice. Out here in the open, these birds rely upon vigilance and stealth to survive. By ensuring that the stone curlew's field of vision remains crystal clear, rabbits deny approaching predators the dangerous element of surprise. And it's not just their appetite that helps here. Burrowing has benefits as well. Tossed aside, stones litter the surface, becoming a backdrop against which precious eggs hide in plain sight. Spring is a time for breeding, and we all know rabbits are pretty good at that. Urine might not be everyone's idea of romance, but it seems to have worked its magic this time. Securing the next generation. Does raise an average of 20 kits every year. For some, this means a glut of prey. Rabbits often make up a large portion of a fox's diet. The grassland's open expanse offers rabbits very few hiding places. But their burrows are a refuge. Deep inside a special nursery nest chamber, the next generation is stirring. Very soon, these tiny paws will venture out into the world beyond the walls of the warren. It's a small hop for a youngster whose species has a giant role to play in the lives of so many others here on Britain's lowland grasslands. The rabbit, I think, is often overlooked as a species. Fascinating, you know, lifestyle that it has. Dominant females, killing the other young, the way they give birth, all that sort of stuff. But the profound effect that it's had on the UK ecology can't be understated. They're not native, of course. Brought here initially by the Romans, topped up by the Normans. They were then spread over much of the UK, warrened, very important for their meat and fur. But, of course, they've integrated themselves into the ecology here. Important as food for many many species, stoats, buzzards, foxes, all sorts of things. Well, it's a good job that they're such prolific breeders because, as you say, they do provide prey for an awful lot of other animals, including raptors. And we've got lots of raptors here, so those rabbits might be providing food for our raptors. Let's have a look at the variety of birds that we've got. As I say, we, we have got a lot of raptors, and the eagle-eyed amongst you might notice that we've got a brand new nest, another brand new nest. Let's go to it live now. It's a marsh harrier nest. Very excited to have this. Another grand nesting bird, of course. And there are three chicks in there. You can see, oh, look at them. Look, they're, they're all... Oh, there's only one, really, awake. Have we got, have we got a live one now on, a, on our live camp? We have. Oh, that's oh, the pair. Got, yes, we've got the pair. That's so that'll the be the male and the female flying around. 
and they're flying. That's, that's exactly where the nest is. Well, it's got food. Look, it's carrying food. You see, that's got food in its feet, so it might, that's the male, pass it to the female, live. Come on. That would be Come amazing. On. Come on. It's got a full crop as well. You can see the bowl just beneath its head. There's the female. Come on, come on, come on. Pass that food. And that's exactly what you'd expect the male to do, drop the food. They're both carrying food. Yeah, oh, they've both got food. Perhaps we've missed that food pass and only half of it got passed. Now, if you're here around this area, then it's a fantastic area to see marsh harriers. You're unlikely to be able to spot the nest because it is oh. very well hidden. But look at that. Oh, my word. So, as I say, un you're unlikely to see them on the ground, but you're very likely to see them just like we have <laughs> in the sky. And we've got a really good food pass here. This is the male. And then the female arrives. And the male does the food pass. And you'll see exactly what we were talking about here. There we go, drops the food, the female catches it. Got a few shell ducks going over their heads. And then it takes it right down to those chicks. What a fantastic thing to see. And it's great as well, isn't it, to have them this early. I mean, it's week one. Yeah, it was only last week three year last we year. We yeah, got it's them, week wasn't three. It? So we're going to see them develop a lot. Brilliant stuff. Another nest that we've taken a peek at, but we can look at again now, uh, is our heron's nest. Again, it's very close to where the marsh harriers are. We've got three nests down there, all on the ground, all raised up on some low, very low trees amongst the reeds. Uh, this is the one that we're looking at. It's got three youngsters. I know they look quite like adults, but they're quite mature. Eggs were laid way back in March. Static at the moment, of course, this side of the evening, but there's been plenty of activity at the nest. They have been leaving, semi-fledging, jumping out to the surrounding vegetation, so there's more space for them, I think, to exercise their wings. And you can just see on the top of that one's head some down, betraying the fact that it is uh, a youngster. This one takes off to the, a nearby perch and does plenty of wing exercising there. And you can see the wings are pretty mature. Those feathers are quite a long way down. Still needing to practice to keep its balance. Still making mistakes. You don't want to do that, mate. No, no, that's, <laughs> that was a, a step too far, that one. So there they are, spread out on the nest. We've been witnessing an enormous variety of prey coming into this nest. And that's not surprising. Again, herons are very opportunistic, feeding on all sorts of things, from frogs to fish to small mammals. Um, just take a look at this and put your knife and your fork down <laughs> if you're eating yourself. Uh, the adult comes back in, regurgitates the food. That's what they do. They have to carry it back in their crop. And a ferocious fight breaks out between the three youngsters as to who gets the eel. Yes, it's an eel. Now, initially, as you can see there, they've all got hold of their bit of the slippery eel. Two in the foreground have got, I presume, what remains of its head, and the one at the back there has got its tail. But listen to the sound. They are determined not to lose their eel. Now, that one a little bit comes off, and that one quickly gulps it, but then it's back in at the action, Unfortunately, the bird on the left hasn't swallowed that quickly enough. <laughs> and this is a tug of war to end all tug of wars. I love the sound. And look at the way they were erecting their prunes as well. They're displaying to one another. And the eye, Mick, the it, eye. It's manic, isn't it? It's got that manic look in it. It's like, I am not going to let go. Who's your money on? Yeah, right. right on the left. Look, oh, 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 you nearly got it, you nearly got it. You nearly got it, but you didn't swallow it quick enough. And the one at the back's given up. And then finally, finally, a last tug. And look, look at the speed. Yay! <laughs> and the eel slides down. Now, kids, do not try that at home at the dinner table with some spaghetti. Well, if you do, then... Tape it on your phone and send it in to us because we'd love to see you reenacting the battle of the eel. Do you know, I think they're fabulous, those, those chicks. I mean, they're, they're boisterous, they're noisy, they're messy. They're actually probably going to fledge. They're 53 days old, so yeah. they might, they could fledge any time. But can you imagine? I mean, after that tug of eel, that meal deal, all that slime all over them, and then the fish comes in, all the fish scales all over them. You can imagine they get really messy, and it's really important for them to stay clean. 
clean. So how do they do that? Well, they have their very own dry shampoo and comb. Oh, yes, folks. <laughs> Let me show you on this rather marvellous heron here. You can see... <laughs> I'll go this side, shall I? <laughs> um, so they have these incredible feathers. They're specialised feathers that don't molt. Instead, they break down into powder patches. And they have them in three areas. There's one under these feathers on the rump. There's one on the inguinal area, which is which is the sort of scrotum area, isn't it? The inguinal. Groin. One on the groin. The groin. And one on the breast here. So those are the patches. They're, as I say, they, they break down into a dry powder. And that's a sort of dry shampoo. And they use it like this. So they get their beaks and then they rub them into those patches. They get some of that powder onto their beaks and then they rub their beaks onto their messy feathers and then that powder will absorb the fish slime and the oil, clean them up and replenish the feathers. And then they'll go back and they'll get some more powder and clean some more of their scruffy feathers. And look at them, I mean, they do look pretty good, don't they? They look pretty clean. And sometimes you can see that a puff of that powder come out. So when they shake themselves, look at that. I mean, that, look, that looks like it's full of talcum powder, doesn't it? Just, and, and again, it's like a great big little puff of, of dry shampoo coming out of them. Yeah. I like that. They have another adaptation as well called a pectinate claw. A pectinate claw. Pectinate means a row of narrow notches all lined up. And here's a model we've got of the heron's pectinate claw. Now, it's not just herons that have these. We see them on cormorants, we see them on egrets, we see them on bitterns, but rather curiously, we also see them on night jars and dippers. It used to be thought that they were used for combing out ectoparasites, but why wouldn't many other species of birds have them? There's clearly another function for them. It could be that they are used... Here you can see the pectinate claw on the centre toe of the heron, and there is no doubt at all that they scratch the powder-down areas and then maybe, using that claw, they reach the parts of the body which the beak can't reach. The chin, the back of the head and the neck where they have to scratch themselves, rather like a mammal, rather than use their beak to preen. And here you can see a close-up of that pectinate claw. Really, really neat. So what they do is they probably have a little scratch like that. Oh, look, oh, look at look, that! There, 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 you know. We've got our own powder down on oh, there like that. I like that and a then lot. they would use their long leg to come up and scratch mm. the back of them. In fact, I'm going to bend this like that. Like, yeah. Oh, no, oh, don't mess oh, it I'm up. It's beautiful. It. Okay. Never it's mind. beautiful. The interesting thing is, you know, we all carry our own pectinate claw, don't we? In the form of a comb. And look at it. That is pectinate. Yeah, but do you have your own stash of white powder in your pocket? I have, and I'm happy to share. I've got my dry shampoo. On it goes. There you go. You can put it through your hair, and you can look as clean oh as a little, this stuff a little heron chick. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And now we know what Chris Packham does as his hair hygiene, and that's why his hair is so thick and lustrous. Moving on. You'll know. What, what do you do? What, what is your hair hygiene routine, mate? I wish I'd had enough hair to worry about hair hygiene, to be honest with you, but uh, there we are. I just, I, just, I just don't bother. Now, whenever I come up here to Mull, I always keep half an eye out on the sea because you never know what's going to happen next. A few days ago, it was breaching minke whales, and over the past two years, on at least two occasions, the most impressive predators in the whole of the ocean have been seen here in Mull waters. I'm talking, of course, about orcas. Now, this was filmed by local legend Andy Tate, and it shows two mature bull orcas, two very well-known characters, too, called Jonko and Aquarius. Now, Aquarius was first recorded by the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust in 2004, and Jonko, remarkably, was first seen way back in 1980. 
1980, so he's, a, he's an old animal. And those two used to be part of a much bigger pod called the West Coast Community. Now, in the 1980s, they numbered around 20 individuals. By the 90s, it was down to around 14. Since then, they've declined further, so much so that they are now, sadly, ecologically defunct. Now, the last female, called Lulu, well, she washed ashore over there on Tyree, the island across the water there, in 2016. And an autopsy revealed the highest levels ever recorded of PCBs in her body. Now, PCBs are polychlorinated biphenyls. They used to be uh, used widespread throughout the UK, throughout the world, but they were banned in 1979 because they're harmful to humans and very harmful to the environment. And the sad news is that they're very long-lasting, so they're still out there now. Despite all of that, John Co and Aquarius continue to wander the oceans, mainly around Mull on the west coast, but also elsewhere. And I've got a map here that shows you every single sighting of John Coe since he was first seen in 1980. And you can see that the majority of records come from the west coast of Scotland here, sometimes over on the east coast. It's obviously circumnavigated Ireland probably several times off the west coast of Wales. And what's interesting is that over the last 12 months he's travelled further south or been recorded further south than ever before. Because in May last year he was seen here off the coast of Cornwall. Now how can we be so confident that all these records refer to John Coe? Well, that's easy. He's got a very distinctive dorsal fin. Come here with me. Have a look at this. This is a model of John Coe's dorsal fin. Huge fin. And as you can see, there's a kink there at the base. So if you're out and about and you see a huge bull orca with that kink at the base, you'll know that you are looking at John Coe. Now, at the moment, there's a fantastic citizen science project going on called Orca Watch. It runs for 10 days and ends on the 5th of June. It's based at John O'Groats and there are Orca Watches all along the coast of Caithness and Sutherland. There are partners at Orkney and Shetland taking part and the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust is organising it not only here on Mull but on the west coast of Scotland as well. And the fantastic thing is that anybody can take part. If you want to take part or if you want to send in records, then visit our website and all the information is on there for you. But if you're up in Mull this spring or this summer and you see two bull orcas floating gracefully past, then you can bet your bottom dollar that is going to be John Coe and Aquarius. Now recently, Meg's ventured out in search of a nocturnal animal that's making something of a comeback. So much so that now it's been found in new sites here in the UK. I've travelled to a secret location in West Sussex to investigate the world of some of our most elusive mammals, bats. There are 18 recorded resident species of bat in the UK, with 17 of these being breeding populations. There are some facing severe declines, but others seem to be on the increase with range expansion, including one I'm hoping to find today. I'm meeting with ecologist Nick Gray, who has been surveying the bats here for a number of years. So why have we come to this site specifically today? Why is it so important? Well, this, this is a form of disused railway tunnel, um, and it's one of a set in this locality. And collectively, they probably represent one of the most significant bat roosts in the country. Uh, and this is particularly important for the greater horseshoe bat, uh, which we've always had one or two, um, but then uh, within the last three or four years, those numbers have increased. That's brilliant. And is it kind of a recovery thing? Is there a reason why those numbers are going up? Locally, we have discovered uh, another site which is a maternity site for those bats, which is particularly exciting because it's the first time we've 
had breeding greater horseshoe bats in the southeast of England for over 100 years. It's early spring, so they won't be in the maternity roost yet. But Nick is taking me to one of the disused railway tunnels which the bats are visiting. We've obtained special licenses to be able to enter, so it's face masks on to protect the bats. And a switch to infrared to minimise any possible disturbance. Red light on. Red light's on. Okay. Let's, Let's go. Head in. These boards were hung in here to provide extra features for the bats to use. I don't really know how you're supposed to look at these. Well, everyone has their own technique. Do they? That, that's not one I think I've seen before. <laughs> but there, there are other ways. Or the easier way is to take a mirror and. Uh, and have a look there. So if you shine the light into the mirror, you can project right. it up behind it. Well, that makes a lot more sense. I feel a bit silly now. It's doing some sort of exorcist yoga. Trying to find these bats. They're much easier. Although, sadly, no bats under this one. Let's continue on. Greater horseshoe bats are some of the largest bats we have in the UK, with this characteristic nose that gives them their name. Traditionally known as cave dwellers, the tunnels here provide the perfect roosting conditions for them as they expand their range from the southwest. It's quite surreal to be kind of out of your element in the pitch black looking for an animal that's entirely in theirs and there's something quite nice about that. Well, I just found a greater horseshoe bat, oh, just one, but it's quite important that we talk quietly, we don't want to disturb it. Of so course. If you just glance up with a red light, you can see it just in the fold. What they look like is that when people ask me to describe them, they look like a small pair. Yes, they do. And, and in fact, there's another species. The lesser horseshoe is a slightly yeah. smaller one, and that looks like a plum. A <laughs> plum and a pear. Yeah. I like that. Nick believes that some of the bats here were born at a nearby maternity roost, making them some of the very first West Sussex greater horseshoe bats in around a century. It's incredibly exciting to think that they could be amongst the first bats to be born in the county. They're such amazing bats but they're very easily disturbed, so I think we'll withdraw now. Sure. I can't see with my mask on, but I've got a really big smile on my face. <laughs> wow, what an amazing find. I can't tell you how happy I was that we actually managed to find some. I was so excited. And of course, it's important to say that these animals are still rare, even though in their core habitats, numbers have doubled in the last 20 years. A really good news story. Now here in Kilda, there are some amazing creatures that live within the river systems. They are a priority species and one of our longest lived invertebrates. They can live up to about 130 years old. And I'm talking about the freshwater pearl mussel. They have a really interesting life cycle. Females can produce between one and four million larvae each in a really dramatic event over the course of about one and two days. And these larvae actually attach onto the gills of certain fish. And in the east of England, typically that is brown trout. And they hang around on these gills of the brown trout for about eight to 10 months as a means of dispersal. And when they're ready, they drop off and they have to find a place to sit in the sediment and grow larger. But you need specific river conditions in order to be 
be able to do that, you need something fast flowing and you also need enough sediment to ground yourself in. But as a protected species, they can be really tricky to find. So I joined Ben Strachan from the Environment Agency to have a little look. Ben, what a gorgeous site this is. Yeah, it's a beautiful river. So what have we got planned? So the plan is to go across the river and check out a really awesome freshwater pearl mussel bed. I'm really excited. So this is why, why we're teed up with waders. And... Yeah, we want to stay dry. OK, hopefully. Should we go in and take a look and see what we can find? Yeah, let's do it. The location of the mussels is a closely guarded secret. We're only allowed to be here thanks to Ben's protected species licence for conservation. Oh my goodness, they're everywhere. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. You can see that this is a really nice habitat for mussels. It's well oxygenated. There's a good flow of water. You can see that there's a good mix of suitable substrates, so a nice mix of boulders and gravels and material that they need. There's a really important area, actually, then, for their populations. Absolutely. I have a mussel here. Thanks to Ben's licence, I'm allowed to take a closer look. I mean, it's amazing. It looks a lot bigger than I expected it to be. Do you have any way to know about its age at all? The mussels at this site, I reckon, are around 50 to 100 years of age. Okay, that's pretty good going. Taking the mussel out doesn't harm it, but I don't want to keep it out of the water for too long. When it comes to a lot of our freshwater ecosystems, like beautiful rivers like this, a lot of them aren't doing as well as this one is, and they are more polluted and struggling. Is it a real struggle for them, then, to kind of get forth into adulthood and grow to the size that these ones are? They're a species that has very specific habitat water requirements, so they would prefer to be in a low-nutrient uh, system. So they probably began life a little bit further upriver. Over the decades, they've sort of been washed down and down, and they seem to have settled quite happily on this little stretch of the river. You can see that there is some sediment in this river, which is a challenge for the juvenile mussels. They are absolutely incredible, and I, I feel very privileged to have been able to come and see them. So thank you so much, Ben, for showing me them. Now, freshwater mussels, pearl freshwater mussels, have been in decline for quite some time. And in the River Tyne, there was great concern because they weren't finding mussels under the age of 20 years old. Especially critical because these mussels are so valuable as ecosystem engineers and also an indicator species telling us about the health of our freshwater ecosystems. But this, of course, concerned so many people. So a captive breeding program was set up. And Ben, it plays quite a big part in that as well. And he kindly set up a bit of an interesting experiment for us by putting mussel, uh, some mussels in a tank, some without, with river water, to see what they do best. And here you can see how important mussels are. On the, on the right-hand side, you can see how clear that water is getting. Now, mussels can filter 50 litres of water a day. 50 litres! It's an incredible thing, and they're so important to keep our freshwater ecosystems healthy. But the declines are numerous, and it's coming at them from all different angles, things like climate change, obviously pollution in the water, and historic harvesting as well causes a big issue, which is why captive breeding is currently being so successful. And the larvae are incredibly vulnerable. When they come out, they're only about 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 millimetres small. They are absolutely tiny. So, of course, we have to wait for them to grow and hopefully be really successful. And hopefully one day they'll grow into a mussel this big. It'll take them a few years after all, but wouldn't that be quite amazing? Chris, Michaela, have you ever been able to see a freshwater mussel? I haven't, but I'm astonished by their age. You always think of, you know, giant tortoises, the large mammals, African elephants, parrots, longest-lived birds, perhaps. Um, but these things are 130. Did you know that the ocean quahog can live for more than 500 years? It's a clam the size of my fist, living for 500 no way. years. <laughs> One in 2006, found south of Iceland, was measured at 507 years old. They called it Ming because it was hatched during the Ming dynasty in China. That's, oh, that's so interesting. I, I mean, I'm amazed Amazing. at the fact 50 litres of water they filtrate a day. I know. That's astonishing. You've got to love a mussel, haven't you? I'll tell you what else you've got to love. These these foxgloves, aren't they absolutely gorgeous? In fact, we have been loving the flower meadows that we've seen here over the last couple of days. They are a carpet of beauty and great to see on a farm 
They're flower-rich margins. There's eight hectares here. It's part of the countryside stewardship scheme to improve biodiversity. They're good for farmland birds, they're good for insects, they're good for pollinators. And yesterday, we looked at the flowers' floral heat patterns, flowers adapting their biodiversity to attract pollinators. But what about the pollinators? Well, like these bumblebees, they've adapted to save energy when looking for the perfect flowers. And they do that back in their nest. So they take all that energy-rich nectar back to their nest. This is what a bumblebee's nest looks like. It's not a hive, it's very different to our honeybees, and it regurgitates that nectar into those special structures that are like honey pots. So, what is their energy-saving technique? Well, to show that, should Hold we on. go over here? Hold oh. on. Yeah, no. What we're going to do... No, you're not going to strip off, are you? <laughs> Only briefly. Goodness gracious. <laughs> right, here, look, I've got a special shirt on this evening. It's loud, it's brash. It's priceless. It's the sort of thing you would be wearing if you were in a cocktail bar. Come across here to Should the Bumble across? Woodland <laughs> Bar for a bit of Hymenoptron mixology. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, like Hymenoptron mixology. You only get that on Spring Watch. <laughs> now, look, what we've got here is a range of different flowers, and we're imagining that this liquid represents their nectar here. So here we've got borage, and here we've got a poppy, and here we've got a daisy. So let's imagine that I'm one of those bees, and I go out and I go to the borage here, and I'm just going to pour it very gently into there. So this is, this is me collecting that, putting it into my stomach, taking it back, regurgitating it into the honey pot in the nest where some of my saliva and evaporation <laughs> will turn the nectar into honey. Now. OK, so I'm a bee and I've gone to the poppy. And so I buzz back with my nectar from the poppy and I will regurgitate that into the honey pot and hopefully it will create a different layer to the blue nectar. So there we go. Excellent That's stuff. my poppy. Excellent stuff. Worked a lot better okay. than it did in rehearsal, yep. got to say that. OK. <laughs> now I'm the final bee here. I'm out and I go to the daisies and I collect my daisy nectar, oh. which, hold on, should float on the surface. No, it is, it is, it is. Is it? It's, yeah, it will do. It's just okay. settling down. Yep. Just settling down. That's good. Now, you may wonder why we're showing these separations of nectar here. Oh, well, look at that. It's that's good, because good. what happens when they're tending those honey pots, which they do constantly to monitor the quality of the, the honey that they've got there, the bees will go up to them and using their tongues, their glossa, if you like, they will dip them into the honey and they will sample it and they are able to taste the difference between those different types of honey. And this will tell them the honey at the top is the honey that's available at the moment. So, look, here we are. Here's, here's my... I'm going to swap that. I'm just going to swap what? it, because there's one we made earlier that is actually a little bit clearer. There you go. It's cheating. It doesn't matter. <laughs> well, they, they, it's cheating like they did on Blue Peter for, for decades. OK, so, look, here, here's my tongue. I'm going in, and I, as the bee, am sucking up that, and I can taste this is daisy nectar, and I will remember that when I go out foraging, and I will head for daisies, because I know that they are producing nectar at the moment because it was at the top of the pot. Oh, yeah, but what about if I go down a little bit and I decide to taste... Oh, goodness, I made a right old mess of that, haven't I? And I decide to taste the... Uh, the borage. There you go, the borage. OK. And, uh, and I decide, well, that's the best nectar, so... If I'm a bee, I'll remember that and I'll go and look for the borage. And it may not just be remembering which is the most available nectar. The bees could also be calculating the sugar content of that nectar. And obviously, the greater the sugar content, the better it might be for making honey. So inside the nest, there's a lot going on which is pretty subtle but has a, a, an implicitly important role when it comes to the optimal foraging capacity of these bees when they're out flying around in the meadows. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing how these creatures adapt and amazing that at this point we've got a little cocktail each. Perfect timing because we can sit back and we can relax and we can take a slow sip of a mindful moment with the long-tailed ducks. Cheers.
beautiful. One but, of my favourite birds. I know, but that's quite surprising because they're quite dull at this time of the year, aren't they? Well, when they go into their summer plumage, they're all a bit chocolatey. Look at this one, a photograph taken by Mark Ranner. This is long tail. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I can see why you like them. I may have to stroke my trousers. <laughs> Just look at that. They are stunning birds they in really winter plumage. Are, they, they really are, are they beautiful. They are gorgeous. Now, Earlier on, we had amazing footage, live footage of Marsh Harriers doing a food pass. Well, just look what Mark got us oh, minutes ago. An owl, a barn owl, hunting. This could, of course, be our barn owl, couldn't it? We've got a camera on barn owl chicks. Oh, it goes behind the hedge there. Let's have a look. Apparently, that is our barn owl. And um, we've got the other parent on the roof, and that is the barn that the barn owl chicks are in. Oh, that's a beautiful Stunning shot. Stunning view. Oh, and off it goes. And that was just Carry minutes that. ago that we saw that. Absolutely fabulous yeah, to and see. And if people were watching our cameras live, which they can do from noon until 9.30, you probably would have seen it yeah. go in and feed that to yeah. its young. <laughs> But sadly, that's all we've got time for today. What's coming up tomorrow? Well, we're going to be sticking our nose into some amorous amphibians as they take their journey to their breeding pond. And I'm going to be looking at the ecology of the gorgeous pine martins. And I'm going to be looking at Mull's magnificent owls. So we'll see you tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Keep your eyes on our live cameras. Anything, literally anything could happen. Join in with all our social media platforms as well. At 1.30 is the time tomorrow to join Hannah Stipfall for what is it? It was horrible, wasn't it? For Watch Out, so make sure you join her. You saw Chris and I dancing today on that, so check that out on the website and on Facebook. But we'll see you tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Enjoy the sunshine. I think it's going to be a nice day tomorrow. Cheers. <laughs>